later today. Fortune, you have the floor. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope I find you well. My name is Fortune, and I'll be taking you for uh, Economics 10B, which is uh, my macroeconomics uh, portion of um, the subject of economics. All right. So without wasting much time, today is going to be an intro introductory session we are not um, going to go uh, into much detail we just want to introduce uh, economics 10b uh, have an overview of what we're going to be looking at and maybe try to look at um, a snippet of the first of the first uh, uh, topic all right has been highlighted by uh, James um, uh, we are also going to be covering the assignment uh, as part of our sessions. So uh, I thought that I should highlight that as well. All right, so uh, for the module itself, the module is uh, contains or rather contains uh, nine units, nine to 10 units, let's see, uh, it's 10 units, which we are expected to be covering thoroughly before we are able to attempt uh, an exam all right so that means that for us to be able to answer or for us to be able to be prepared for the exam we should have covered all these uh topics and subtopics thoroughly uh before we can attempt uh, a full exam uh, paper or exam session all right so uh, uh the units uh 10 units that i've highlighted but uh, we are going to try to cover each unit in each session that you're going to be having, which means that each session that you're going to be having, we're going to try to cover each unit uh, entirely. As you can see that the units also have subtopics within them. The first unit is uh, for measuring the performance of the economy, and we'll be having subtopics within it, uh, the macroeconomic objectives, measuring the level of economic activity, et cetera, et cetera, up to the distribution of income. So that is our first topic. We're going to start with that one uh, on a snippet, then move on to the other uh, topics. Then we have the monetary sector, the public sector, the foreign sector, uh, the Keynesian model, um, then uh, the Keynesian model, including the government and the foreign sector. Then we have... Uh, the macroeconomic theory and policy, then unemployment, then unemployment and inflation, as well as inflation, then sources of economic growth. So these are the main topics that we need to be covering thoroughly before we can be able to attempt uh, an exam. All right. So on the right hand side of your screen, I'm sure you can see that is uh, the notes that you're going to be using today uh, to try to uh get into the subject of economics all right so the first uh, topic that we are introduced with our module is measuring the performance of an economy so we understand that whenever uh, we are having an activity whether it's a, uh, a business activity or whatever activity it is you would need to have some form of uh, measurement that you use to measure the progress uh, or rather the attainment of the uh, objectives that you have at hand um, in that particular activity. The same applies with the subject of economics. Uh, we also need as economists to be able to see uh, to what extent uh, the policies that we are enacting on an economy, are they um, reaching out in terms of achieving the objectives that you want within that particular economy? And we'd also need to make sure that uh, are we being progressive enough uh, as an economy in comparison to other economies? So we need to have a metric that we use. We need to have a proxy that we use to be able to uh, ascertain uh, the measurements or the performance of an economy. So we just want to look at an overview of how uh, an economy is or what an economy is from an economist uh, perspective. 
So this is usually expressed in what is referred to as a circular flow of income and spending. So a circular flow of income and spending, uh, first of all, highlights the participants that we have within an economy. Then it highlights the markets that are then created as a result uh, of the participants' activities amongst themselves uh, and as they interact uh, within each other. So the relationship between these participants is what forms uh, what we refer to as an economy. So there is no economy with only one participant. We need to have all the participants in action for us to have an economy. I think we all understand from the uh, word economy, uh, the echo aspect, which is in relation to an ecosystem aspect where we need to have uh, a set of inter interrelated um, uh, interrelated um, uh, participants within the economy. So the same applies with the subject of economy. Economics, we need to have interrelated interrelatedness uh, aspect um, in economics. So uh, in your economics 1A or in your microeconomics, you're introduced to uh, the participants within uh, a market that we have mainly the firms, the households. Then when it becomes a mixed economy with uh, government intervention, it it, we also have um, the government as a participant within the economy. So this particular economy represents what you refer to as a closed uh, economy. So within a closed economy, uh, it just highlights the uh, participants that are within an economic system without including the foreign sector. We understand that there is the foreign sector in which we also deal with imports and exports, foreign direct investments, etc. Um, but you see that as, the, uh, as, as we progress into this uh, module, into this subject, we would expand into the foreign sector. We're going to start with a two-sector economy, then move to a, uh, an economy with the government, then we move on to uh, an open economy with the foreign sector. So you'd see as we're going to be progressing with our lectures, um, what you're talking about. All right. So having the participants in place, the firms, the government, and the households, uh, you'd realize that these participants have different needs within a market and uh, are endowed with different um, endowments in terms of uh, resources and factors, which uh, are required by uh, one another. For instance, you look at the households, we understand that the households are the owners of the factors of production. Uh, where you can see here that uh, the factors of production are mainly land, capital, and um, natural resources, uh, your entrepreneurship uh, skills, which are the resources that are required by the firms, these firms that will be on the other side of uh, the market uh, to produce goods and services, which are then required by both the government and the households. So as the households provide these factors of production to the firms, that is where we have the creation of what we refer to as the factor market within an economy. That is where you realize uh, the market where factors of production are traded, the labor market, the capital market, uh, et cetera. Then as the firms would make use of these factors of production, uh, making use of the land, making use of the natural resources, making use of the labor, making use of the capital, uh, they produce goods and services. And as they'll be producing these goods and services, uh, that is where we have now the creation of what we refer to as the goods market or the goods and services market uh, in a broader uh, term. So in the goods and services market, that is where you have your various goods in general, your consumables, your, um, uh, your long-term goods, your assets being sold in the goods market, uh, which are then consumed by the households um, uh, in, 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 in different ways and in diverse ways. So as a result, you would see that uh, as the uh, factors of production are being made use, there is remuneration that is going to the households in form of uh, salaries and wages, in form of rent, in form of profits. And as the goods and services market is taking place as well, you would see that um, uh, the, the, the households would be paying in form of spending to the firms in order for them to acquire the goods and services. So in a nutshell, you can see that uh, from this perspective, you can see the whole module that we're going to be dealing with in terms of macroeconomics. You can see the 
uh, first topic that we are dealing with in terms of measuring the performance of the economy, how we are going to be measuring the performance of the economy, uh, either from the spending perspective or from the income perspective or from the value addition perspective from the firms, which is all the methods that we're going to be using to measure the performance of an economy. And you would also realize the second unit that you're going to be dealing with, which is the monetary economy, whereby we are looking at uh, the monetary spendings, how the monetary system is going to be operating because they need to exchange these goods and services in a form of a value, which we now refer to as money, which is a medium of exchange. And that was that what we'll also be studying in terms of unit two, which is our monetary um, our monetary um, chapter. Then we also have unit three, which deals with the government or the public sector, uh, which deals with the activities of the public sector, the composition of the government, what is it that comprises of the government, the roles of the government in the economy, uh, and what is expected of the government in relation to uh, its duties within the economy, as well as its failure, the government failure, whereby we are looking at the failure of politicians, bureaucrats, uh, etc., cetera, uh, being a drawback of the presence of the government within an economy. Then we also move to um, uh, where we now have the foreign sector, uh, where we are having the foreign sector in existence. Now we'll be having an expansion where we'll be having the foreign sector that deals with imports and exports. We're going to be talking about it uh, later on. Uh, etc. So you'd see that most of the things or most of the topics that we're going to be deriving are coming from this circular flow of income and spending. All right. So from there, we can get on to what we refer to as the macroeconomic objectives. Macroeconomic objectives. So as I have highlighted earlier on, that when we are in, an op when in, in operation as an economy, uh, there are various targets uh, or rather various objectives or various policies that are put in place in order to achieve certain objectives. So these objectives are the main objectives that are then used to measure the performance of an economy. I'm sure you understand from maybe your management, elementary management modules about uh, modules, uh, about objectives and plans, uh, that objectives are basically uh, plans that are put in place or aims that uh, policymakers would be seeking to achieve. So these are the main aims that uh, any economy is to achieve if it is to be deemed uh, progressive or prosperous. The first one is achievement of what we refer to as economic growth. The second one is uh, achievement of full employment. The third one is price stability. The fourth one is external stability. The fifth one is equitable distribution of income and wealth. So we're going to be delving into these one by one. Uh, but since today is an introductory, I think we're going to be looking at economic growth just for today. Then uh, the rest, we're going to be looking at them as time progresses, um, maybe from next week uh, onwards. All right. So we want to look at first the first objective, which is economic growth. So you need to understand all of these objectives. This is uh, where your examination is starting. They can bring a, uh, a question either within your assignment or within your exam. List five macroeconomic objectives uh, of an economy. So you need to be able to list these macroeconomic objectives. First one is economic growth. Second one is full employment. Third one is price stability. Fourth one is external stability. Fifth one is equitable distribution of income and wealth. Then now we're getting into the explanation of each objective. The first one which is uh, economic growth. So with economic growth, the first thing that comes into your mind is what is economic growth? What is it? that we refer to as uh, economic growth. What is it that comes into your mind when you hear the term uh, economic growth? All right, so by definition, economic growth refers to an increase in the production of goods and services uh, within an economy. And obviously it has to be compared from one period uh, to another. So you might be given the uh, value of production from one uh, period. And if you are to compare it with another period, you can see uh, either uh, the, the, the existence of an economic growth or uh, an economic, um, uh, uh, we might refer to as a recession, which is the reverse of uh, uh, growth. All right, so with economic growth, you need to understand that what is to increase is the production of goods and services within the economy from one period to another. 
that means that if you are to bring that to um, uh, an understandable perspective, you'd want to look at, suppose that we are having an economy that is producing wine, for instance, in South Africa, we produce wine uh, in Cape Town. Suppose that, this is just a hypothetical example, suppose that in last year was 2021, in 2021, South Africa produced 100 liters or 100 million liters of wine. And in 2022, you are told that South Africa produced 102 million liters of wine. So comparing 100 million liters of wine that has been produced in uh, 2020, so we're saying 2021, suppose that you've been told that um, production was, uh, production was 100 million uh, liters of wine in 2022, uh, you are told that production is 102 uh, million liters liters of wine. So from this, you can see that there is uh, there is economic growth uh, from the fact that you can see that in 2021 uh, there was only 100 million liters of wine that has been produced, and in 2022 there is 100 and 2 million liters of wine that has been produced. But when it comes to now the definition of economic growth, you can see that this is the growth not just uh, in the whole economy, but this is the growth in the wine industry. But when it comes to the definition of economic growth, we are now uh, combining uh, the production that is happening, not just in the wine industry, but in the agricultural industry, in the vehicle manufacturing industry, in the real estate industry, etc., etc., etc. So now, when this comes into play, you'd see that you'd be having diversities of uh, uh, composition of goods and services that are being produced. You have 100 million liters of wine. You have uh, 300,000 cars that you're going to be having for these goods and services for you to be able to see whether um, we, 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 we are growing in our economy or we are diverging in our economy. So the value now, when it comes to the value within the economy, that is where we need to have a metric of measuring this, uh, this, this, this production that is taking place. So in general, you can say that obviously it increased by maybe 2 million liters of wine between 2021 and 2020 uh, and 2022 but in value terms that is the uh, the, 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 the the aspect of economic growth in terms of measuring comes into in monetary values to action that is happening that is now what you are referring to as gross domestic product gross domestic product so with gross domestic product Gross domestic product refers to the total value of all the final goods and services that has been produced within the boundaries of a country in a uh, with uh, obviously the period in question. All right. So with gross domestic product, we are now attaching value to the production that is happening within the economy. We are now attaching value to the uh, production of wine, the production of cars, uh, etc., so that we can see in value terms how much. Uh, value have we produced within the economy and when that comes into play we are now talking about prices we are also going to be talking about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, having that value attached to um uh, to production and how we can uh, uh, uh subvent the disadvantages uh, attached to that all right so in terms of uh, the metric that is used in measuring economic growth we use what we refer to as gross domestic product, which we say it refers to the total value of all the final goods and services produced within the boundaries of a country in a period of a year. And uh, usually these statistics are compi compiled by uh, States SA, as well as the South African Reserve Bank. They are the main um, uh, bodies that are responsible for combining uh, these, uh, these figures. So if you are looking for the figures of how much GDP uh, is South Africa produced in 2021, and how much GDP is uh, South Africa is is now producing in 2022? You 
can go to the Reserve Bank website or you can go to the State SA website and find those information. They will be available. All right. So I, I, I've seen some assignments in the previous uh, sessions, uh, in the previous uh, years, uh, whereby they ask uh, the students, uh, what is the GDP of South Africa currently? What is the, the many metrics that are found within the um, those websites? They might ask, what is the current inflation rate? What is the current unemployment rate? So you need as an economist to also be um, uh, privy to these uh, statistics. You can visit the website so that you can become um, acclimatized to the um, to the information there. All right. So once we have identified that uh, economic growth can be measured using a metric of GDP, we need to uh, have uh, an understanding of how it is measured. So that brings us to the subject of three methods that are used in calculating GDP or in measuring the value of GDP. All right, so when it comes to the measure of the value of GDP, there are basically three methods that are um, used in coming up with the GDP statistics. The first one is the production method, which is referred to as the value added method. The second one is the expenditure method, which is referred to as the final goods and services spending by the um, economic participants within uh, an economy. Then the last one is um, the income method, whereby we measure the incomes that is, that is being received by the factors, by the owners of the factors of production during the uh, market interaction phase. So we looked at the market interaction phase where we have three participants mainly and uh, what they are giving in the factor market as well as what they are receiving in that same factor market. So all of that, you're going to be looking at it. So I want to look at these methods one by one uh, and try to demystify them um, one by one. All right, so the first method is the production method or the value added method. So the production method or the value added method, uh, GDP is measured as a summation of the value that has been added at each phase of the production process. All right, so we understand that uh, when production takes place, it doesn't take, pl take place uh, on one go, but um, it is a process. Uh, you take raw materials from the factory or from uh, the ground, uh, you convert those raw materials into work in progress. From the work in progress, uh, there's a lot of work that happens in between until we have a final good or a product that is then sold within the market. So during the production phase, the production process of that particular good or service, the value that is being added to it during its manufacturing uh, processes is uh, then added throughout its uh, production value chain for us to get the value of that product. And that is the value of GDP if you are to add the value that has been added of all the products that are being manufactured in the country uh, during their production phases. All right, so you'd see this in many industries. You can see this from the diamond industry. When diamonds are extracted, there's rough diamonds from the ground. You can see that uh, the value that they have is different from the value that they finally have when uh, it is now presented as a jewel or as a gem that you now see one of these celebrities wearing, telling you that uh, this gem is worth, a small gem is worth maybe a hundred million dollars. But when it is extracted from the ground, the value wasn't as much as it was. There was value addition that took place when they were polishing it, when they were trying to uh, process it uh, in order for it to be presentable within the market. So the value that is being added in between, if you are to add the value addition at each production phase, you come up with uh, the uh, GDP value. All right. Then the second method is the expenditure method. The expenditure method. So with the expenditure method, GDP is measured as the summation of all the expenditures or the spending that is done by all the economic participants within the economy, all right? So we looked at a closed economy and we looked at a, an open economy when we we're looking at the circular flow, where I say that uh, within a closed economy, you have your main participants as the households. You have 
uh, the firms that were on the other side, which are the uh, users of the factors of production. You have the government, which plays the role of the regulator. Then you have the foreign sector, the foreign sector, which uh, is responsible for imports, uh, exports, and uh, foreign direct investments. It comes also from the uh, foreign sector, uh, investments, etc. All right. So these main participants, or rather these four participants, are what makes up an economy because they are the participants that interrelate with each other in order for us to have an economy so households for instance spend on goods and services that has been produced by firms uh, within the goods market or the goods and services market and firms spend on uh, investment purposes on acquiring the factors of production or expanding their um uh or on expanding their plants or expanding their um expanding their plants or expanding their uh, um, uh, uh, manufacturing plants uh, and machinery etc property plant and equipment etc and the government also spends in many ways uh, either through creation of employment or through the provision of social services within the economy like health uh, providing um, education providing security uh, etc. Then you have the foreign sector, which is mainly uh, the which brings imports and which uh, necessitates the exportation. So these spending activities that happen within the market, where we are having the household consuming the goods and services, the firms investment spending, the government spending, as well as the foreign sector net foreign sector spending that we get, we refer to it as net foreign sector because. Uh, it is the difference between the exports and the imports. We're going to be looking at that one uh, later on. That gives us the net foreign sector uh, spending. All right. So the spending by households is referred to as consumption spending, which is given an abbreviation C. As you can see, GDP is equals to C. And the investment spending by, um, by firms is given the abbreviation I because it's firms that are spending on uh, uh, expanding their uh, goods and services, their uh, plants, property plant and equipment. Then we have the government. Government spending is abbreviated G. And X minus M represents the net foreign sector from abroad, where X represents exports and M represents imports. You can see that X is positive and M is negative. Why is X positive wise m uh, negative so exports are regarded as an inflow to the economy because when the economy is in operation uh, and um, uh, the, the the firms are producing goods and the goods are ending up being exported to other countries the country ends up receiving inflow of wealth or of income that is why we have x as a positive and imports represents a negative because whenever we're importing either goods or services from other countries, it means that we are having an outflow of wealth or of, of, uh, uh, of resources within the local economy. Uh, and hence, as a result, uh, it is a negative. And if you want to delve deeper into that, you'd see that uh, with, ex with, uh, with imports, imports create, uh, support the, the external economies or rather the foreign economies more than the local economies. Whenever you are buying from China, you are creating employment in China, you're providing for uh, the Chinese economy. And whenever you're exporting, you're creating employment locally and you are providing uh, income and wealth within the local economy. Uh, so that is why we have the difference between X minus M. But uh, we also understand that no economy operates in a vacuum. An economy has to have uh, an open policy whereby it can import and it can also export. But there are various policies that we're going to be looking at that can be used to minimize this importation when you'll be looking at uh, international trade. All right, so the summation of these spendings, the consumption spending by firms, the consumption, consumption spending by households, investment spending by firms, government spending, plus the net foreign sector from abroad, 
gives us the value of GDP. Why are we saying that we get the value of GDP whenever we are uh, spending? Because all the goods that would have been produced within the economy ends up being spent upon by all the participants within the economy. So that is why we get the value of GDP from this method of the expenditure method. So this particular one, we're going to be using it more often than not. You'd see that uh, as we get into macroeconomic theory and policy, you'll be now having what we refer to as aggregate demand. This is what uh, represents aggregate demand because uh, it is the demand that is placed upon the economy by local participants as well as uh, foreign participants on the goods and services that are available within the economy. And hence, it would be uh, also a representative of uh, the probable aggregate expenditure within the economy, which then drives what we refer to as the economic growth, etc., and determines the equilibriums within an economy. We're going to be looking at that one uh, later on. Then uh, we have lastly the income method. So the income method, we looked at the production method where the firms are producing and value is added at each stage of production. We looked at uh, the other side now where the firms were spending, the, the participants were spending, sorry, uh, on the goods and services within the economy. And, and we get the value of GDP because the participants are consuming the goods and services within the economy. Then now we want to look at uh, the income method. So as we have highlighted earlier on, that these participants, especially the households, are the providers of the factors of production to the firms. And when they provide the factors of production to the firms, they are, they are remunerated in form, of in, uh, in form of various incomes. So these various incomes, if they are to be added, uh, they give us also the value of GDP because the moment the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, the moment the, the firms spend on these goods and services, we get the value of GDP uh, uh, that is being uh, received or that is being created within the economy as a result of lending those uh, various factors of production. So for factors of production, you have your labor, you have your capital, you have your entrepreneurship, as well as your natural resources. And in form of their remuneration, when you give your labor in the market, when you go to uh, the labor market and you say, I want to look for work, I want to look for employment. Right now you are learning in order for you to get into the labor market. When you get into the labor market, you are seeking a return, which is in form of salaries and wages. So labor is remunerated in form of salaries and wages, and that is part of uh, the GDP. And if you have capital, if you have a certain amount of capital that you have, you go to the uh, markets, now that is the monetary market, you invest your capital, and that capital brings you interest. So when you invest your capital, you get uh, your interest. And, and if you are an, an enterprising individual, you create an you set up a, a, a business, a small to medium enterprises, a big business, you expect to get profits from that business, and that profit is also part of the GDP. And if you're going to be lending out your natural resources, especially in form of land uh, and all these other natural resources, you are likely going to be remunerated in form of land of rent. So that means that when we sum up all these uh, incomes or all of these um, uh, 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 incomes or remunerations that are being received by the factors of production, you get your GDP. That is the general value of uh, GDP. So in general, that is those are the main methods that you use to calculate GDP. So after measuring uh, your methods, either from the income method or from the production or the value addition method or from the spending method, all of those must give you the same figure. That means that if either you're going to go through the production route or the income route or from the spending route, you are supposed to get the same figure because uh, all of those are representing uh, the value of the goods that have been produced within the economy. So that is uh, uh, an important um, thing to note. So when we're going to be advancing, you would see that uh, we are going to be having production and income on one side and spending on the other side, which is uh, particularly um, 
now an independent variable which is not necessarily linked to production and income whereby we are looking now at macroeconomic theory and policy and the Keynesian model and the propagations by Keynes uh, where uh, the spending sometimes is not always equal to production and income and trying to derive macroeconomic theories from that all right so in a nutshell that is what um, is represented by all the methods that are used in measuring uh, GDP. All right. So um, having uh, come to that, we can come now to the formula that is used to calculate GDP. So for you to calculate GDP, it is calculated as the difference between the current year's GDP minus the previous year's GDP divided by the previous year's GDP times 100. So putting that in figures, um, suppose that you've calculated your GDP for 2020, 2021, and you get certain figures. Let's just use uh, a hypothetical figures for now. So let's say for 2021, you have calculated your GDP and uh, you found out that uh, maybe it was 500. Let me just use 500 billion rand. In 2020 and in 2022 you say that your gdp is 600 billion rand so i'm using obvious figures so that it doesn't become vague 600 billion rand so for you to calculate your gdp it's calculated as 600 minus 500 divided by the previous years which is 500 then you multiply that figure by by 100 let's see with the calculator here what are we going to get so we're saying 600 minus uh, 500 divided by 500 times 100 to get it in percentage terms okay uh, then you get, uh, did I do it correctly here? Yeah, I wasn't seeing, let me see. They're saying 600 minus 500 divided by 500 times 100. 20%. So that means that there is a 20% growth there will be a 20% growth if these are the actual figures in the GDP in uh, 2020, 2022. All right. So uh, you can see that here we've just taken the figure of 500, taken the figure of 600, but bringing it to uh, a practical perspective, especially now, uh, Let's say that this 500 billion rand is represented or rather is comprised of or comprises of, I'll just give one product here. So uh, bear with me, I'm not, going, I'm not going to bring many products so that it becomes uh, understandable. So we talked about 100 million liters of, uh, million liters of, of wine. Or rather, let me use uh, fuel, suppose, that we produce fuel. I think that's the most uh, practical example. Suppose that in 2021, South Africa produced 100 million liters of fuel, which was to the value of 500 billion rand in 2021. And in 2022, you realize that South Africa again produced 100 million liters of fuel, but now the value of the fuel is 600 billion. Can we say that there was economic growth uh, when only it is the monetary value that is increasing value and the production has remained uh, stagnant. We are still having 100 million liters, uh, but now in 2021, there were 500 billion in terms of value. But in 2022, because uh, of many uh, reasons, the value is now 600 billion rand. Can we say that there is economic growth in South Africa as a result of that? All right, so that brings us to the issue of what we refer to as nominal and real GDP.
nominal and real GDP. So with nominal GDP, we are saying that this is the GDP that is recorded at current prices. So uh, in 2021, you might understand that uh, the price of per litre fuel maybe was around 16 rand. And in 2022, now the price of per litre fuel is now 25,000 um, 20, is now 25 rand per liter. So that means for the same value that you'd be having, suppose that you're now having 1,000 liters, maybe that you're stocking, that you bought last year, and you decided, uh, let me just put it uh, uh, in, in one of my jerry cans, et cetera, and uh, you, you, you're you just stocking that, that fuel, you haven't used it, and you bought it at 16 rand per, per liter. It means that in 2021, you paid a total sum of 16,000 rand for you to acquire, 1000 liters at 16 rand per liter and now in 2022 we are now in july and uh the price per liter of fuel is now around 25 rand per liter uh that means that for you to be able to buy that same 1000 liters of fuel you need to have 25000 rand which is different from what we had in 2021 so that that is just a snippet of what we're referring to as nominal GDP. This is GDP that is recorded at current year's prices. And the problem with nominal GDP is that uh, it is not sensitive to inflation. It does not take into inflation into account. It just assumes that the values that are there are representative of the increase in the growth, yet it's an inflationary aspect that is occurred in between. There is no growth. Uh, there is no employment that has been created, but there is an inflationary aspect that is uh, occurring within the economy. So in order for us to circumvent that, uh, that is what we refer now to as the real GDP, whereby we now measure GDP at constant prices. And when you're measuring GDP at constant prices, you are measuring the, you're measuring the GDP at a price, which we refer to as a best year price, in which... Um, the prices were regarded to be stable. So that means that for you to be able to see where there is uh, real growth within the economy, you can use the real GDP metric, whereby you are multiplying, uh, or rather whereby you are ascribing the value of the production to prices not that are current, but that have occurred in, uh, in the past in which the prices were much more stable. So for instance, in the year of 2000 and I'm just using hypothetical examples. I'm not particularly sure if that year was the year with the most stable prices. Suppose 2011 was the year with the most stable prices. Maybe uh, per litre fuel was around 10 rand or 12 rand, uh, etc. Or even 8 rand, maybe lesser than that. Uh, that means that in that year, if you're going to be using that year as your uh, your it means that you are able to see whether there is real growth within the economy or the growth that we're having is, is monetary. To produce 1,000 liters, 1,000 liters, and the best year. So by the best year prices, then you get a value. The same thing again you do in, uh, in 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 the in the in the preceding year or in the next year you use that same 1,000 liters, then you multiply it by the base year prices for you to compare and to see whether uh, there is real growth or the growth is just nominal. And if the prices remain the same and the production doesn't change, it means that there is no real growth. And if the production changes and the prices are not changing, it means there is real growth. So that is the most important thing that we're going to be dealing with in uh, the subject of economics in relation to uh, economic growth. All right, so that brings us to the end of measuring the performance of um, economic growth spectrum, not the performance of the economy as a whole, because we still to look at full employment, price stability, um, uh, external stability, as well as equitable distribution of income and wealth. So in relation to this one, I don't know if you have any uh, questions that you'd want to ask before we close the session, since we say that you're not going to be talking too much today. It's just an introduction. 
and if you don't have any questions i have questions that i want to ask you so suppose you are presented with uh, the following questions 1.1 which of the following major macroeconomic objectives in most economies is a major macroeconomic objective in most economies so we talked about the macroeconomic objectives and by now you should be able to identify a macroeconomic objective so you can type on the chat uh, so that we see uh, whether you are which of the following is a major macroeconomic objective in most economies a to increase the exchange rate of the currency b to reduce import taxes and controls c to increase economic growth d to stabilize the price of petrol all of the above thank you uh, to increase economic growth to increase economic growth all right thank you very much and uh, somebody had typed lillian had typed c that is the most correct answer so we talked about the macroeconomic objectives we talked about economic growth full employment uh price stability external stability as well as um equitable distribution so c is the correct one well done. Then 1.2 is stating that the three major types of markets in a circular flow of income and expenditure are the three major types of markets in a circular flow of income and expenditure are, so we talked about the circular flow of income and spending, and we talked about the markets that are created. A is stating public markets, private markets, and non-governmental markets. E is stating factor markets, monetary markets, foreign exchange markets. C is stating goods markets, service markets, factor markets. D is stating goods markets, factor markets, and uh, financial markets. Then E is stating uh, public markets, private markets, and financial markets. Which one do you think is the most correct answer? Which one do you think is the most correct one? The three major types of markets. Uh, you're saying B or C? C. C. All right. C, goods market, service market, factor markets. Anyone with a different answer? Anyone who thinks otherwise? Are we all agreeing that C is the correct answer? Okay, see someone. Yes. All right, everyone is saying C. Lynn is also saying C. All right, so C is not the correct answer. C is not the correct answer because uh, the service market and the goods market is saying three major types. So the service markets and the goods market are one market. So the service market actually is within the goods market. So C is not the correct answer. But the correct answer that we're looking for there is option D, which says goods market, factor market, and financial markets. All right. So financial markets, that is where you go with your capital to invest for you to get interest in the financial market. So we didn't highlight that as we were talking, but I, I just passed through it as I was um, talking about the uh, incomes method, etc. So we have the goods market, the factor market, and the financial markets. You will understand this one more as we'll be talking about the monetary sector, which is the second unit of uh, the module, and how uh, the financial markets uh, operates, etc. All right, then we move on to 1.4. If you were, okay, let me just move up a little bit. If you were to add up remuneration of all the factors of production in the economy, we would obtain, if you were to add up remuneration of all the factors of, the, uh, of production in the economy, we would obtain A, gross domestic product using expenditure method, B, 
GDP using value-added method, C, GDP using income method, D, GDP using production method, uh, E, GDP using a new method there that is called the mathematical method. Right, someone is saying C. Are we all agreeing on C? Lillian is saying C. Rakiso is saying C. Um, anyone else with a different answer? All right, so the correct answer is C. You obtain GDP using income method. So uh, that is the most correct answer. All right, uh, so that brings us to the end of today's session. It's 8 o'clock now. Uh, I think we uh, we have uh, introduced this, this module and uh, we try to give a picture of what we're going to be dealing with and some of the things that we're going to be looking at. I don't know if you have any other questions before we close this session. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Fortune. Are we going to be able to access the notes? All right. Yes, you will be able to access the notes. Uh, we will be sending you the notes uh, after each and every session. These are not uh, can you just uh, because re repeat uh, the part where the, the camp. Oh. All right. I didn't get you clearly there. Somebody was talking about, I should repeat the part where, and uh, something happened, I don't know, it's on my network or it's on your network. Can you please repeat your, your, your question? Am I still audible? Yes, you are. All right, I think uh, we've lost him. All right. Uh, somebody was talking about um, are we going to be accessing the notes? We'll be sending the notes after each and every session that uh, we're going to be doing. So in terms of the next session, uh, for now we can still remain on Thursday. Then we'll uh, advise later on for those that are going to be joining us throughout um, uh, on the dates. So we're going to be agreeing on the actual date that is uh, on the days sorry, on the day that is actually uh, uh, convenient for all of us. So for now, we can see that the next session is, is again on seven, se uh, on Thursday, seven o'clock. All right, then somebody is asking, okay, I think they were asking about uh, the next session. All right, uh, have we exhausted all the questions? Anyone else with a question? okay so let me okay let me see the chat all right there are no questions um all right all right so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much um have a pleasant evening until we meet again uh next week so uh goodbye thank you bye thank you goodbye